Blunt weapons are a seriously underrated melee class in Cyberpunk 2077. From hammers, bats and battens to other everyday bludgeoning tools, this playstyle has a lot of different options, all very powerful and fun. As always, I looked at them all so you don't have to. Here's how to acquire each, their best uses, as well as of course which is best. Though there's plenty of cool details to learn along the way, so let's get to it. The build I constructed for this video is a special thing indeed, specking entirely into body, reflexes and tech with absolutely nothing in intelligence or cool. You'll want the health regen perks from body, as well as obviously the blunt weapon ones, eventually aiming for these powerful buffs at level 20. Reflexes then purely for air dash, and you can leave off any gun related perks. Then into tech and its cyberware buffs, as well as heals slash pyromania, with ticking time bomb and edge runner particularly useful. Into cyberware, and it's finally time time to break out the Berserk, our panic button for when things get tough, with other important items being Adrenaline Booster to regen stamina, Dense Marrow to increase attack speed, and Adreno Trigger to bolster our physical movement speed. After that, grab the best armor, health regen, and damage mitigation where you can afford, and try to fill every slot, as it'll reduce our Berserk's cooldown. But with this seriously powerful build out the way, it's on to some seriously powerful weapons. Bottom of this list, the classic hammer is very much a style choice when running a berserker build in 2.0, with superhero landings and barreling into people looking especially cool with this weapon. But when we take a look at the stats, this thing does no more damage than a baseball bat, despite the cumbersome debuffs of increased stamina cost and classing as a heavy weapon, forcing us to move around slower. I tried adding a cyclone mod to unlock maximum attack speed, though it didn't feel particularly effective, with barbarian being a much better choice to batter everyone you're going to stagger. Despite losing out to the bats on the attack side of things though, I did eventually realize the hammer gains an upper hand in protect. Blocking with this makes for a very satisfying clunk, and attacks do drain your stamina bar a little lower than a bat. Just don't take this up against enemies with a tendency to dash away from you, as it can be too slow to swing, forcing us to rely on quake and barreling. Fortunately, the hammer is a very easy weapon to come by, and the crafting spec is bought from the animal vendor in Rancho Coronado. I don't know about you though, but I've still got that glitch where he's hostile, precipitating the need for optical camo if I ever want to trade with him. If you find one of these earlier on in the game, then just be a little careful. Its slowness, after all, can make it harder to escape tight situations. This is going to be a 3-in-1 entry, as whilst the steel pipe, tire iron, and basic crowbar are all different items, statistically they are completely identical, all found as common enemy drops from street goons and scanner hustles. Though I can confirm buying a pipe and crowbar from Coach Fred with a definitive spawn I found for tire irons over here in Rancho Coronado. Each of them is a relatively decent balance between attack speed and damage, with each being slower but also more deadly hit for hit than the other one-handed weapons. They they all have slightly different sounds too, with steel pipe being clunkier, crowbar not so much, and tire iron about in the middle. And that's probably the best and only way to distinguish which you prefer, unless maybe you're a proud plumber, mechanic, or theoretical physicist from MIT. They're very basic, everyday things, arguably more so than anything else, but slap on a mod or two and they actually start to shine. There's not really a weak entry to the three blunt weapon mods, with KO straight up doing more damage, but becoming slower. If you want to shift these more towards the hammer bat damage end of the scale. Blood Bruiser, if you're happy to go lethal and want an added bleed effect that matches the chance of stun, or best of the bunch but also rarest is Barbarian, dealing a 40% damage at tier 5 to anyone stunned, staggered, or knocked down. Pair that with the Wrecking Ball Barrel ability, and you can take on crazy big hordes. I am amazed at just how easy it was to defeat Police and Max Tack with this method using just these common, unassuming items, and I seriously don't get why Berserk builds aren't more popular, though I guess it's because of edge runners. Think of Caretaker's Spade in 2.0 as essentially an iconic hammer. After all, the statistics line up, and the Spade 2 classes as a slower, heavier weapon. Though of course it's much cooler, albeit only attained after completing one of the game's endings, the Sun, and it's pretty easy to miss, with a number of different spawns generally around the Arasaka Rainforest's meeting table. You'll have to rummage through trees until you see the gold icon. Whilst it may literally have belonged to Arasaka's Rainforest Caretaker, it 
It's actually also a very on the nose reference to The Witcher 3. The caretaker in that is actually an other dimensional, faceless entity, forever bound to serve the Von Everek estate. After defeating it, Geralt can similarly loot the caretaker's spade, which heals 10% of the damage dealt with every hit. Our caretaker's spade, alternatively, has an inbuilt, very powerful heal on kill, which, if you're taking out tons of opponents very quickly, can help keep you very far away from death. I'd recommend heavier attacks with this as well for maximum effectiveness. What's more, if we look closely, there's even sometimes the same dimensional green glow from swinging the thing. Could this tie in with the ending to FF06B5 and the other dimensional stuff going on there? Well, maybe. But there's nothing solid tying them together as of yet. For now, just enjoy an easily superior, but still pretty cumbersome hammer variant and one of the biggest Witcher references in-game. Once upon a time, Sasquatch's hammer was simply a red textured, non-iconic weapon that uselessly couldn't be upgraded. Now though, it is by far the highest damage per hit melee weapon in the whole game, sitting at double the next best thing. Striking the ground with this thing just hits different. It hits better, with its superior bludgeoning power ignoring almost all armour, and knocking down most everyone in the first hit. So why then isn't it sitting higher? Well, you see, where this weapon does accentuate the hammer's best strengths, it does the same with its weaknesses. A very heavy weapon, which much like the O5 sniper, removes sprinting, dodging and dashing, as well as overall just being very slow and cumbersome. After all, it weighs over four times more than the hammer, and certainly wasn't built for us, but rather for this abomination of muscle, whom we'll loot it from after defeating her in the I Walk the Line quest. In fact, it's impressive that we can wield it at all. But I figure for those wanting to become a hammer-wielding tank, this is probably the best choice. After all, the regular hammer is just a slower equivalent to the baseball bat, and at least with this one it's a different style of play. A heavier, more damaging style. Just remember to sheath it any time you want to move more than 10 feet or do any climbing. And maybe keep your berserk in reserve for when you're almost dead, as it can be a real pain to run and find cover with this. A trio of melee weapons with a bit of a kick next, the batons are a lower damage but also much faster swinging tool, which dish out an electrical charge to inflict bonus shock damage. Additionally, swing it against a tightly packed enough cluster of combatants, and each will take damage and potentially shock, which is particularly great during heavier handed encounters with law enforcement. No crafting specs for these that I could find, but they are generally discovered throughout the world, and I bought a model of each from Coach Fred with a little weight scumming. Alpha has a studded design with just 25% armor penetration, but only a half second between electrical charges. The more liney beta is 0.75 seconds, but does ignore 50% of armor, whilst gamma does the same with a one second charge time, but also 5% greater chance to shock. Personally, I would run with alpha for more shocking hits overall, but honestly, it doesn't make a whole ton of noticeable difference in practice. What is noticeable is the reduced damage compared to other blunt weapons. Some Something the shock factor only makes up for again when facing down multiple foes at once. Against the common singular enemy, especially in later game where stun is less noticed and appreciated because we're just so damn powerful, I would say higher damage and fewer swings to take an opponent down is more important. Still one of the best things to have against crowds though. I know, we already covered the crowbar earlier, but trust me, this iconic version is completely different, but to get it, you'll first have to side with Reed during Firestarter and pursue that path for a bit. Once you then get to the somewhat damaged quest, make sure to rummage around the waterworks we initially go through before you jump down this big hole. Buried at the back here, in the dark, is a crate, containing the diary of someone brainwashed by the AI below to merge with the system. But I went over that in the Phantom Liberty Ending Secrets video. Today we're talking about their trusty as always crowbar, with double the attack speed of the regular one but a 40% reduced damage. Significantly noticeable but a higher overall DPS. Problem is though, once you factor in the same stamina cost per swing, this doesn't translate so well in drawn out fights, even with cyberware buffs like adrenaline booster. The higher damage, slower weapons or even the electric batons all feel just as effective as this thing. And then I realised this isn't really designed for berserk. See, rather than 
and swinging in a triple arc pattern, like melee weapons, the crowbar, much like Piako, has an unlocked speed, particularly effective to use with a Sandeviston. So whilst it's one of the weaker weapons in the build I've been using, a simple switch from Berserk to a Sandy made this one much more effective. The perfect Biako alternative even, were you to take my endless Sandeviston build and switch out the blade perks for the blunt weapon ones, essentially trading out lunging and bullet deflection for barreling and superhero landings. Not a bad trade depending on how you like to play. If you're a fan of The Walking Dead, then you'll already know this, but never underestimate the seriously deadly bludgeoning power of a simple baseball bat. One of the best weapon types in-game, striking a perfect balance of speed, power, and stamina cost. After all, they are literally designed to be swung easily and with precision, with the same level of damage as the hammer, but with an action less like hitting a big nail and more like hitting a home run. Indeed, heavy attacks with this will send enemies flying, and I would highly recommend, if you're into this class of weaponry, using these at any given point throughout the game. We can even buy a crafting spec for it from Coach Fred in our mega building. Though it's also pretty common around the place, with most gangs it seems having decided to design their own custom respray. It works great with pretty much all the melee mods, including Cyclone, which can boost swinging speed after sprint attacks, or even the Chimera Core mod Severance, to occasionally insta-kill enemies at the lower end of their health pool. And believe me when I say tunes, there have been few things I've enjoyed enjoyed more in my whole time with this game than dashing around with a baseball bat in a highly powerful berserk build, easily beating the hammer on account of not being heavy and weighed down. Alternatively, if you're an individual of culture, specifically Japanese culture, you can instead run with the Kanabo, statistically identical to the bat as far as I can tell, and meaning metal club in Japanese. Studded metal club by the looks, and this one can also be bought from Coach Fred or I found mine at Sophia's in the stadium. There's also plenty to loot about the place too. Though the best overall base variant of this weapon is obviously its Xmod 2 model in Dogtown, across from the Heavy Hearts Club nearish to where we find the Achilles towards the end of this suspended walkway. Now not only can we upgrade this variant and overwrite mods with different ones to test different combinations, but the fact that it's studded similar to Negan's barbed wire contributes to a 30% chance to bleed on top of the standard stun. Not a huge difference once you have a powerful berserk build, but certainly still a bonus effect, appreciated especially earlier on when you're less powerful. Plus this one is free, so might as well be your go-to unless you prefer a different design. An easy and early blunt weapon to obtain, Cottonmouth is the property of Jig Jig's creepy ripper doc, Fingers, who, now that all cyberware is available at all rippers, has absolutely no Sand Everston or Pain Editor to hide behind anymore. Regardless, this weapon is and always has been fair game to pick up during the quest Automatic Love. You'll want to do this as it's one of the best one-handed blunt weapons out there, hitting with the same speed as the steel pipe and all that lot, but with a slightly reduced damage, made up for by both a 25% chance to shock and to poison. Pretty straightforward, a nice balance of speed and damage like the regular tool weapons, and easy to deal with hordes of max tack in this later game berserk build. I'd say the definitive ease by which to acquire it and the doubled elemental damage though do give it a slight edge, and make it a very strong early game blunt weapon especially. Then using it later and watching how much extra health is depleted over time under both these effects, it's clearly a very useful passive extra which lasts for a few seconds after our attacks. Not a game-changingly interesting weapon compared to some, but gained plenty of points for being effective and reliable. With the regular versions of the baseball bat performing so well then, how could the gold-plated iconic possibly top that? Well, with metallic spikes protruding from the end, this one has no less than a 100% chance to bleed on every hit, as well as a slightly boosted stun. You can't of course mod this one, so technically the X Mod 2 could still win out, but the maximum bleed we can get on that is still only 70% with two blood bruiser mods. Fair enough if you still prefer that, but this is a very good alternative. Not to mention also totally free and picked up during the end of Second Conflict after it's ragefully tossed away by the total rock legend that is Denny. And if this is good enough for one of North Oak's three residents, then it's good enough for us.
It was tough, choosing which of the very powerful baseball bats ultimately came out as best. But in the end, I've got to hand it to Lena Molina's Baby Boomer. You can get this after the dazed and confused side quest, but only provided you choose to say Tool is Lena's sister or an FIA clone. I've gone over every choice and the morality of this quest in my terrible decisions video. Alas, choosing one of these, Lena will immediately leave behind this on the counter as a thank you. It's definitely the bat with the coolest pattern. I would say, even if it's functionally less deadly in reality. Though it does offer the unique ability to mark enemies as losers when hit, massively increasing the bat's crit chance when we follow that up. That's pretty cool by itself, but not really much difference to guaranteed bleed in practice. The real difference is this bat's 20% increased attack speed from 1.2 to 1.5, and only 10% reduced damage, contributing to a higher overall DPS. It also makes it the fastest swinging two-handed blunt weapon in the entire game, with a constant edge of speed that even carries through into the overpowered late game. Tinkerbell behaves very similarly to the electric batons, its abilities lining up closest with the gamma variants, albeit with a higher shock chance still. Though in terms of its speed and stamina use, it swings far more in line with the steel pipe, crowbar and tire iron, though with quite the reduced damage. However, none of this really matters, and what secures Tinkerbell this spot on the list is its iconic ability of potentially instantaneously knocking out an enemy with a strong attack, making it a particular standout whatever level you are. Now I assumed this only extended to the regular foes and didn't therefore apply to bosses, but I summoned Max Tack anyway just to check. However, turns out that yes indeed, with a little luck, this can also drop Max Tack members who are still at full health. Of course, that does still require said luck and a surrounding build strong enough to withstand going against them in the first place, but even still, that makes this one well worth holding on to. Just make sure not to miss it by looting Anthony Harris's secret room when we come to to Edgewood Farm during the hunt. There'll be a hidden button under his desk in the farmhouse, and that pretty much ties up just how this guy sedated so many unassuming victims. A creepy weapon with a creepy accompanying static sound effect. Murphy's Law is the pessimistic but often true view that anything that can go wrong will go wrong, like switching to a shorter queue, only for the first one to then start moving faster. In this case though, Murphy's Law is the name of the iconic Barguest Baton owned by the engineer Albert Murphy, dropped by him during our escape from the stadium, but only provided we side with songbirds. Reed fans cannot get this, sadly. It's very similar to the Gamma Baton, but with an additional 20% chance to bleed. Fortunately, the everything going very wrong aspect appears to apply apply more to our opponents than us, with additional unique buffs of increasing our attack speed the second we start hitting knocked down enemies, as well as already powerful strong attacks dealing yet more damage. It hilariously puts multiplier effects on the worst possibilities, and even with this insane berserk build, I very much noticed that in combat with the strong attacks especially. If you're wanting more knockdowns for that extra speed as well, then the best ways to get those are with superhero landings or charging with wreck. Ball. Overall, this weapon easily held its own with the slower, higher damage ones on offer, with its speed and ability to hit multiple enemies at once, making it one of the best crowd control weapons to take. Sure, it doesn't have Tinkerbell's rare insta-kill, but aside from that, this does have more going for it. Plus, the green paint and the blood look awesome. Just a shame it's locked behind one of two ending paths. Sir John Falasif has been Cyberpunk's joke weapon since day one, a tool not traditionally designed to inflict pain, unless you're into that, and one which when held will permanently vibrate. Previously property of Meredith Stout, she leaves this behind for us after our encounter during the Venus in Furs quest, which itself is only unlocked if we side with her and go against Maelstrom during the pickup at the start of the game, bearing in mind this will lock us out of getting the Doom Doom Revolver later. Assessing it purely on weaponized potential potential then, is Sir John worth it? Hell yes. Whilst the speed is registered at 2.2, slower technically than the iconic crowbars 2.6, Sir John feels like it swings faster against an individual, and technically it does, executing a triple arc of swings but then needing to pause, where the crowbar never quite swings that fast but then also never stops, technically averaging out faster. But that is to say, taking down weaker enemies in three hits or less with this is more effective. And Sir John 
Leon, despite being made for a totally different purpose, utterly excels at fucking people up. Its damage is lower than the other tools, but the speed makes that pretty much unnoticeable. And vulnerability analytics especially really makes this a nothing factor when we can simply hit those destructive EMP points a lot quicker. Additionally, hitting people in the head will shatter their dignity so much that it increases our crit chance by a very nice 69%, while strong attacks will stun the living daylights out of anyone again with a 69% chance. Oddly specific, but I don't know, there's just something nice about that number. So once again, this seeming joke of a weapon is actually one of the best melee options out there in terms of its old penis, and definitely not one to be slept on. But recently added in 2.1 was a John Falastiff alternative. Longer, harder, and readily available to find, even to those who didn't side with Meredith. Over here, down from the damn viewpoints, is a crashed AV, and a dude named Hugo Selvig. Seems we aren't the only one who realizes what deadly weapons these things can be. And deciding we're a threat, Hugo opts to defend himself with the BFC 9000. A Doom reference first and foremost, but I'll leave you to figure out what BFC stands for here. Now, this encounter is a little bugged, and many have had trouble getting it to come up. Hopefully, the next patch fixes that, but if not, then just plug in this command. You don't need to hit people specifically in the head with this one to proc that same 69% crit chance. It can be anywhere on their body, but only if you're above 50% stamina. Getting tired with this one can lead to performance issues. Range is also increased by 50%, that's a very useful benefit, and I suppose must be a scientific representation of real life life averages. Finally, strong attacks don't stun in this instance, but rather just straight up to 10% more damage. I guess because of the additional, you know. Anyway, it's a close call with these two, but in the end, I guess size really does matter. Well, that and general availability. Though there is one other body part, which I'd argue is an even better fighting tool. I really didn't want to undermine this entire list by putting these at number one, but the thing is, the results just speak for themselves. I merely test these things and attempt to offer the fairest judgments. And after hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, tool upon tool for every purpose you could imagine continually redesigned and perfected, it turns out that the best and most deadly blunt weapon was under our nose all along, quite literally. Admittedly, Gorilla Arms are a highly modified equivalent to our own fists, and where before our hands have acted as a middleman by which to hold our instrument of death, it turns out it's far more efficient for they themselves to become it. They don't even occupy a weapon slot, instead functioning as our armed cyberware, leaving our options far more open. There's also the choice of 20% chance to bleed, burn, shock, or poison, which could be made out of pure preference or to synergize with other weapons. They do deal lower damage than several of the normal options, but win out with their tremendously faster attack speed of 2.6 beating just about everything else in the game, save for the Mantis Blades. Like I said, fists just are more efficient. Add on top of all this, the charged shockwave emitted when using strong attacks unlocked in the relic tree, and that just about settles it. Basic Brawler V is definitively one of the most goated builds, along with the rest of the arm mods which I've talked about in this video. Though please don't let any of that put you off trying the other blunt weapons too. After all, total power is but one factor, and fun should take priority over that. So let me know in the comments which of these weapons you've had the most fun with, and subscribe if you haven't already and are curious to see what comes next. Huge thanks to the patrons as always for supporting the channel, especially for videos like this that don't always perform quite as well, but that I still want to remake for 2.0 completionism. Hopefully you found this one useful, I'm Sabram, and thank you for watching.